The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. I'm going to try to speak without using the room microphone, so if, 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 if I'm not loud enough, either let me know or come forward. Um, I, I wanted to begin by thanking the organizers of the conference, um, Benjamin Hill and especially Jessica Gordon Roth, on behalf of all the people who came from out of town to attend this wonderful lock workshop. Those of you who are taking uh, Professor Gordon Roth's course may find be amazed at the fact that people devote their lives to reading Locke and enjoy it. There could actually be uh, a great pleasure for them to come together with other people like them and uh, talk about the text. But we've been doing that with great excitement for the past uh, a couple of days, and we're grateful to them and also to Lehman College and the University of Western Ontario and to the students of the philosophy department at Lehman College for making us all so uh, comfortable. It's, it's a great personal pleasure f for me to be here because although I, although I grew up in Queens, the Bronx is my ancestral home. I, I, went, I went to Bronx Science, which is on the other side of Harris Field, and my father went to DeWitt Clinton High School, which is just beyond Bronx Science, and uh, he grew up across Marshall Loop Parkway, very close to here, and he spent his whole working life in the neighborhood where he grew up, so I spent a lot of time there hanging out with him. And although I don't think I set foot on the Lehman College campus, or what is now the Lehman College campus until this visit, um, I walked past it many times when it was Hunter College because I, I swam when I was at Bronx Science, but Bronx Science is an unusual school. We have an observatory, but no pool. Walton High School had a pool, and so we walked from Bronx Science to Walton to practice and then, and then, and then back to school. So I passed Lehman College many times. So it's a great pleasure to be back in my father's old neighborhood and, and also a great pleasure no longer to be in high school. I'm very, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, glad to be here. This is a paper on Locke on Kinds, and I'm going to begin at the beginning, uh, and this is uh, uh, um, under one on your handout, with uh, God's creation, uh, which seems, as it's described in the King James Version of Genesis, from which I'm quoting, which seems to be a creation not only of individuals, but of the kinds into which the individuals fall. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. 
And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after his kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw saw that it was good. Locke was a dedicated and very close reader of the, of, of the Bible, and he gave the following account of some of the passages I've just read. And this comes from his first treatise of government, and it's under two on the handout. God, having created the fishes and fowls the fifth day, the beginning of the sixth, he creates the irrational inhabitants of the dry land. Here, in the creation of the brute inhabitants of the earth, he first speaks of them all under one general name, of living creatures, and then afterwards divides them into three ranks. And ranks means kinds or sorts or species. One, cattle or such creatures as were or might be tame, and so be the private possessions of particular men. Two, wild beasts, and three, the creeping animals or reptiles. He speaks of these kinds as sorts, uh, as ranks. Uh, species and even kingdoms. Um, um, you, you see a, uh, an indication of that in the very next passage, when God had made the irrational animals of the world divided into three kinds. So on Locke's reading, he didn't just make the individuals, he made them divided into kinds. So I'm, I'm assuming made the kinds into which they were divided. And he follows subsequent verses of, of Genesis when he says that God gave Adam and Noah and the sons of Noah dominion over all these kinds of irrational creatures. So he speaks in the third passage under two uh, of, of God's uh, grant to Noah, comprehending all the species of irrational animals of the terraqueous globe. So the created world, which is given to us in its nearest reaches, reaches to use and care for, and in, its, and in its near and far reaches for us to study and admire, is for, for Locke a structured world of kinds. What is it, though, for God or anything else to create a kind as opposed to the individuals who fall into the kind? Um, uh, is a kind merely a collection of individuals, or is it something more? The individuals that, that enter into a kind are presumably alike, but how alike do they have to be? Is it enough for them to share a few salient characteristics, or must they be, as one 19th century entomologist said, and when he said this he was echoing Locke, although he may not have known it, must they be cast in molds like so many iron pots? Do the members of the kind need to share a common nature or essence? And if they do need to share a common nature or essence, do we need to, should we be striving to capture that common nature or essence in our systems of classification? Locke thought deeply about these questions and he gave firm answers uh, to all of them. In Locke's opinion, if God is the creator of kinds, it's only because he works through us. And that's because kinds, in Locke's opinion, are social constructions. We make them. Uh, we make them together or collectively. The boundaries between them, and this is true even of the boundaries of what you might be called, tempted to call natural kinds, and it's actually the kinds of things you'd be tempted to call natural kinds that, I'd be ta that, that I'll be talking about this afternoon. So uh, kinds of substances found in nature. The boundaries between natural kinds, according to Locke, reflect, uh, they're drawn by us, and they reflect our interests, perspectives, and preoccupations. They're not altogether arbitrary, as they are perhaps for some present day uh, advocates of the social construction of kinds, because they're responsive to God-given or natural similarities. So that similarities are there, and they're not due to us on Locke's view. They're brought about by God or thrown up by, by nature. But the mere existence of the similarities isn't enough for there to be kinds. In order for there to be kinds, we need to go to work on uh, the similarities. And therefore, if God is creating kinds, he's, cre he's, he's creating kinds only through us by means of the work that he equipped us to carry out once we entered the scene. Um, I'm, uh, this talk is going to have three parts. In the first part, I'm going to continue the story of creation beyond the first week. I'll actually start 
in the first week, but I'm going to assume that in the early stages of the first week, kinds don't yet exist. My starting point is going to be a world of individuals alone, and I'm going to show you what it would take in the rest of week one and in week two to bring kinds into being, my thought being that understanding what a kind is, or that we can better understand what a kind is, by observing them as they come to be in a world in which they don't yet exist. So we're going to begin with a world of of, of individuals, of scattered individuals, if you like, and I'm going to show how, in Locke's opinion, there come to be kinds um, um, in that world. Uh, God, I, I often mention God, but God's not going to be essential to the story I tell. If you don't believe in God, you ought, you still should be able to appreciate what Locke, uh, what I, on Locke's behalf, am going to say. So if you believe that 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 things in nature are the product, and this is a possibility that Descartes considered briefly in the meditations and then soon dismissed. If you believe that nature is the product of fate or chance or a continuous chain of events, you should still be able to follow what I'm saying. But I think speaking of God will make it easier uh, to appreciate it. At one point, perhaps, it may be better not to think in terms of God, but I'll warn you when, uh, uh, when we reach that uh, point. So I'm going to begin at stage one. The stages are outlined under three on the handout. Uh, stage one, in which God creates a world of individuals, each with its own real essence, that's Locke's word, or generative core, that's my word. I call it a generative core because it's whatever it is on the inside of the thing that generates the manifest, observable, or discoverable qualities of the things. Uh, the thing. Um, um, the word real essence is introduced in the first passage that appears under Roman numeral one, under three, on the handout. Essence may be taken for the very being of anything whereby it is what it is. And pay, pay close attention to that phrase because I'm going to make a lot of it in the course of this talk. I'm going to try to be intelligible to the students here and at the same time interesting to my colleagues who've been with me in the past two days. I hope that I can do that, but the interest of it for my colleagues depends a great deal on my laying emphasis on these words, whereby it is what it is. And thus, the real internal but generally in substances unknown constitution of things whereon their discoverable qualities depend may be called their essence. This is the proper original signification of the word as is evident from that should be the formation of it. Essentia, that's the Latin word for essence, in its primary notation signifying properly being. And in this sense it's still used when we speak of the essence of particular things without giving them any name. Uh, the names he wants you to put out of your mind for the sake of understanding what he's saying here are general names. General names like sperm whale, mammal, and animal. Put them out of your mind and fix your thoughts on a natural substance like Moby Dick or that thing there. All right? You notice that in bringing it to your attention, I didn't use any of the general names I said you should dismiss from your thoughts. I used a proper name or I gestured toward the thing or, or, or pointed to it. So fix your thoughts on that thing. There is something in that thing, but the very being of the thing, whereby it is what it is. And that's what Locke calls the real essence of the thing. And I'm uh, going to think of this real essence as that thing's private possession. It's not something that that thing shares with anything else. It's, 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 it, 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 it's, it's that thing by which that thing, on my understanding, is the very thing it is. And if that troubles some of my colleagues who are here, I'll spell that out a little bit as follows. Don't worry if you're a student and don't understand why I'm saying this. I'm just protecting myself from objections that might be made from my colleagues here. It is. It is the very being of the thing then. All right, it is, it is the very being of the thing then. Now, um, um, Locke thinks of these real essences in the case of bodies, which are the kinds of substances I'm going to be talking, I think, pretty much exclusively about. Locke thinks of these real essences uh, as um, systems of insensible particles 
uh, textures or arrangements of insensible particles that he called uh, corpuscles. He's not at all sure that that's what these real essences are, but he thinks that's the best guess about the nature of these things. So when I speak of the real essence of Moby Dick, I'm speaking about a corpuscular constitution that, that, that makes Moby Dick the thing, Moby Dick, that Moby Dick is. Um, um, the expressions Locke is using in this passage, whereby it is what it is, are English versions of Latin phrases that were very familiar to Locke as a student of philosophy in 17th century Oxford. I realize now this may be your wor worst nightmare because I'm about to talk a bit about Latin. Um, I, I'll say before I do it that in many ways Locke didn't like Latin either. Uh, he wrote in Latin, um, um, but, but like a lot of his fellows uh, in the 17th century, he didn't have fond memories of learning Latin because learning Latin was taught in really oppressive ways in those days. These young boys were subject to uh, hours and hours of what must have seemed to them to be endless drills, and if, they, if their attention flagged or, their, or they fell asleep, they were beaten. Um, um, so uh, Locke didn't have, I think, fond memories of his education in Latin, but his, his philosophical thinking, which he very much preferred to do, in my opinion, in English, he's constantly taking Latin expressions and domesticating them with English equivalents, clarifying them by appealing to English translations of them. But in this case, I think it's helpful uh, to recall the Latin formulas that he's um, that, he, that he's modeling his English words on. Um, so in speaking of the very being of anything whereby it is what it is, he's adverting to a distinction that was made in the 12th century by a man named Gilbert or, or Gilbert in a commentary that he wrote on some works of Boethius. And it was a distinction that Gilbert made between what he called the id quo est, this is on the handout, and the id quod est. The id quo est is the that by which it is. It's just the whereby uh, of a thing. And the id quod est is the that which it is. So when Locke speaks of the very being of anything whereby it is, what it is, and calls it its essence, he's recalling the kind of definitions of essence given in the textbooks that he was familiar with as a student at Oxford and as a tutor, a teacher at Oxford. So on the handout, you'll find uh, a, a definition of essence from a man named Burgersdyke. This is from a book of metaphysics that Locke actually recommended to his students. Essence is nothing other than that whereby a thing both is and is what it is. And you'll also see quotations from logic handbooks by uh, people named Richler and, Richel and Scheibler. I'm, I'm not sure Locke, uh, I have no evidence Locke used these books, but these two books were published in edition after edition in Locke's Oxford. I'm, I, 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 these quotations come from editions actually published in, 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 in Oxford, editions that just poured off the presses there to serve the students of the, uh, of the colleges. I've already suggested that I'm going to think of the real essence as a private possession of the thing that has the real essence. I'm also willing to think of the real essence as the thing itself, considered in its active aspect. And that's why I call it the generative core of the thing. It's that aspect of the thing that generates, insofar as the thing is responsible for generating, the manifest, discoverable, or apparent qualities of the things. I give under, on the handout some evidence that Locke uh, thinks of, of um, um, these real essences as private possessions. Like almost every bit of evidence in Locke, it's likely these things I'm about to read will not overwhelm you because they could be read in another way, but I'm going to uh, offer them to you, hope you see why I find it plausible to read them as I do, and then go on whether you accept my reading of them or, or not. So uh, he says at one point, for example, it's certain that everything that exists has its particular constitution. And I'm uh, I think it's natural to understand that particular constitution as the private possession of the thing of whose constitution it is. The real constitutions of things, he says in the second passage on the handout, begin and perish with them. So it seems the, the particular constitution or real essence is something that comes into existence as the thing does and then 
re is removed from existence when the thing itself is removed from existence, again suggesting that it's the private possession of the thing or the thing itself. And a quotation uh, from Locke's uh, correspondence with Stillingfleet, which is better than the ones on the handout, perhaps, but which I did not include. Uh, I'll read it to you, though. Uh, there he speaks of that internal constitution or frame or modification of the substance which God in his wisdom and good pleasure thinks fit to give to every particular creature when he gives it a being. And I think those three passages together, especially the third perhaps, very much, very strongly suggest that this real essence is the kind of private possession I'm insisting it is. There is, however, as I acknowledge on the handout, an ambiguity in Locke's formula. It needn't be read the way I'm reading it. I'm reading it in the A way distinguished on the handout. Do you all have a handout? I notice not all sets of eyes are looking eagerly at the handout as I refer to it. It's a very good handout. Uh, um, and there are bound to be more copies, because I made 60. And they're, they're quite a, can I just walk back with some of those? Because there are quite a few people in the back without them. So there's an ambiguity. I'm, I'm sorry. There should be, there should be more. I, I, paid, I paid Staples an outrageous <laughs> price for 60 copies of this handout. And, and are there, maybe there are more than 60 people here. And if so, I'm sorry that I, that I don't have more. But I'll try to read these with as much expression as I can. There's an ambiguity in the formula that I'm, that I'm, that I'm making so much of, uh, whereby it is what it is. I'm reading it in the A way. I'm reading it as saying, whereby it is what the very being that it is, but there's another way of reading it, the B way, whereby it is what it predicatively is. That is, whereby it is yellow, for example, and shining and fusible. I'm not reading it in the B way. I'm reading it in the A way, but I, I can imagine making a case for reading it in the B way. Uh, now, whether you read it in the A way or the B way, um, the real essence that I've been talking so much about, and I'm beginning to regret talking quite so much about it as I am, um, um, the real essence is intrinsic to the thing, as Locke indicates in the next passage on the handout. By this real essence, I mean that particular constitution which everything has within itself without any relation to anything without it. So it's intrinsic to the thing and not a matter, the thing's possession of it isn't a matter of the thing's relation to anything beyond it. Um, um, in substances, he says in another place, and I am taking this passage out of context, and some of my colleagues may be disturbed by this, in substances, their real essences lie in a little, comp in a little compass, meaning that the re uh, Moby Dick's a big thing, so I can't make this point very vividly with the example of Moby Dick, but imagine now I'm holding a smaller natural substance in my hands. The real essence of that natural substance is packed within the boundaries of that substance. It's confined within the outlines of, of, of the substance. So the real essence is, is there or that or in there. Nonetheless, the manifest qualities of the substance do not depend only on the real essence of the substance. They depend also and crucially on the surroundings of the substance. And Locke thinks that we're not only ignorant of the insides of the real essences of natural substances, he thinks we're ignorant of the things on the outside of the substance on which the manifest discoverable or, or sensible qualities of the substance uh, actually also, also depend. So, so, so the uh, manifest or apparent qualities of a, of a natural substance are the result of a co collaboration between what's inside the boundary of the substance and what's beyond the boundary of the substance. And we uh, have no way of telling, in general, how far out from the boundaries of the substances the other things that influence the way in which that real essence expresses itself lies. So our ignorance of, of real essences and their manifestations is very, very deep. I, I, I don't have time to explain in full how deep our ignorance of it is, but we don't know the real essences themselves. That is, we, we don't see within the boundaries of these uh, substances, but we also don't know what it is that lies beyond the boundaries upon which the manifest qualities of the substance in part depend. And Locke brings out this point in a wonderful passage from which I quote only part. Uh, this is still under one on the handout. Things, however absolute and entire they seem in themselves, 
are but retainers to other parts of nature for that which they are most taken notice of by us. The expressions of a substance or the apparent qualities of a substance are the upshot jointly of the substance's inner nature or real essence and the nature of things that lie beyond the substance. We can't identify those other things with any certainty. And of course, once we did, we'd find ourselves as unable to identify their real essences as we are unable to identify in any detail the real essence of the thing we began with. And since the manifest qualities of the thing we're talking about are the joint upshot of its real essence and these other real essences of things that we can't even locate, uh, we're very deeply ignorant of the real essence and of the expressions of the real essence. I hope that's all uh, clear. Um, God um, in stage two, and stage two is another stage in my story that's actually already taken place in week one, God, or nature if you prefer, makes things alike. Uh, as, uh, as Locke says in the, in the passage I quote under two, nature makes many particular things which do agree with one another in many sensible qualities. There are uh, um, um, many apparent points of agreement, that is many discoverable or manifest points of agreement between one natural substance of the sort I've been talking about and another. There are many, many such similarities according to Locke. In fact, the, two, the similarities are too numerous for even the most conscientious observer to catalog. There are lots and lots of them. Locke suggests that these um, um, substances are uh, probably alike too in their internal frame and constitution. That is, he suggests that they may be alike on the inside as well as being alike on the outside. When I speak of them as being alike on the outside, I mean they're alike in their manifest qualities. Uh, but um, likeness at the le level of real essence, likeness, internal likeness between real essences is not going to play any role in the story of kinds of the creation of kinds that I'm now telling you. There may be shared real essences, um, 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 real essences shared among things. Uh, I'll talk about that a bit later, but they play no direct role whatsoever in the creation of kinds, and they're not needed for the creation of kinds. Even if there were no similarities between the internal constitution of Moby Dick and the internal constitution of another sperm whale, sperm whale, we could just as confidently create the kind sperm whale because the creation of the kind sperm whale, as you'll see, doesn't depend on similarities at the level of internal constitution. It depends only on the observable similarities and on the response we make to them. So stage one, we're given a world of individuals. Stage two, uh, uh, these individuals, we are told, are alike. In stage three, we actually commence our active participation. We're not, standling, we're not standing idly by. And now we're at least at day six, but maybe we should pretend we're in week two now. So we were created on day six, we rested on day seven. Now on day eight, we go to work on the creation of kinds, which on my telling of Locke's view, um, would not be there were it not for the efforts we undertake in the second week. So we're not standing, standing idly by, we're observing things and perhaps experimenting upon them. Uh, for example, we uh, uh, notice that around us there are parcels of matter that are hard and distinctively yellow in cast. Right? We collect some of these parcels of, uh, uh, of matter and we form a general idea or abstract idea of such things. That is, we form the abstract or general, or general idea of things, substances, that are hard and yellow in cast in just the way our first samples of these substances were yellow in cast. Um, in doing this, um, um, we are, um, 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 uh, we're coming up with what I'm imagining is going to be quite an economical idea. It includes only hardness and a distinctive color and whatever else you need in order for there to be hardness or distinctive color. I assume you'd need uh, extension or, or space occupation and solidity as well. So there'll be a very small number of, 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 of qualities or features included in uh, our abstract idea. In forming this abstract idea, we leave out something that uh, we find in each individual uh, uh, from which this abstract idea 
I'm obviously talking about the abstract idea of gold, from which this abstract idea is, is derived. So one parcel of gold will have a certain size and shape. Another parcel of gold will have a different size and shape. We look beyond the differences in size and shape and uh, fasten on the features that these two parcels of matter have in common and thereby form an abstract idea of those things, that is, an abstract idea of, of, of gold. In doing this, Locke says, we're making nothing new. We're prescinding or selecting. We're merely removing from our idea of each thing something that's uh, common to that idea and our idea of other things. And we thereby generate an abstract idea of those things, an idea that captures some of the manifest features that these parcels of matter have in uh, common. That was stage three. Stage four. At stage four, uh, uh, it, it turns out that as we, uh, um, 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 you know, um, as we participate in the whirl of life, our abstract ideas uh, uh, tend to vary. Uh, some of us might be very satisfied with the abstract idea of gold that I've just described, but other people might want to experiment on these parcels of matter and find out more about them. So some people might melt them or stretch them or reshape them. And those people might begin thinking of gold not as something that's merely yellow uh, uh, in a distinctive way and hard, but as, but, as, but as something that's also fusible, ductile, and malleable. Uh, qualities like fusibility and ductility aren't as obvious as qualities like hardness and distinctively yellow color, but they're still manifest or discoverable or sensible in the sense that Locke um, um, uh, intends. Uh, and so we find ourselves with many different abstract ideas of gold, as Locke seems to be recognizing in the first of the passages like, that I quote under four on the handout. The properties of any sort of bodies being at least so many that no man can know the precise and definite number, they're differently discovered by different men according to their various skill, attention, and ways of handling, who therefore can't choose but had, have different ideas of the same substance, and therefore make the signification of its common name very various and uncertain. So, so I'm imagining here that we're in possession of the common name gold, but we're attaching different abstract ideas to the common name gold because we're struck, or interest, we're struck by or interested in different uh, uh, qualities present in these parcels of matter we call gold. As Locke says in the second passage, I quote, the number the mind combines depends on the various care, industry, or fancy of him that makes it. We're the victims here of a kind of democracy of idea formation. Uh, everybody, as Locke indicates in these passages, has a right to form whatever abstract idea they please. Um, everyone has a right to put into his complex idea, he says at the end of the first passage, those qualities he's found to be united together. And at the end of the passage following that, or two passages beyond that one, who of all these has established the right signification of the word gold, or who shall be the judge to determine? There, there is no one who is the judge to determine at this stage, as I'm understanding it. So here we are with our various abstract ideas of gold, each responsive to gold as it presents itself to us, but responsive to it in different ways. Um, you may remember that in Genesis, after Adam is created, the animals come before him to receive their names. In the, uh, um, um, in the story as I'm telling it, no one at this stage anyway possesses um, the kind of authority over nomenclature that Adam presented, uh, that, that, that possessed. There's a, there's a nice quotation here on the handout from um, Milton's Paradise Lost. Nice because uh, Milton, in expounding uh, um, um, uh, the Genesis story, uh, uses more philosophical vocabulary. This is Adam speaking or, or thinking, I named them as they passed and understood their nature with such knowledge God endued, that means endowed, my sudden apprehension. I think we're being told here that in Milton's opinion, Adam did see into the deepest nature of these things. Uh, we, however, don't. And it will turn out that even if we didn't, it wouldn't make any difference to the story as I'm, as, I, I, as I'm telling it to you. Adam did, and that perhaps gave Adam some authority. At this stage, it won't be harmful to think of that. In the end, it didn't give Adam any authority, Locke would say. But we certainly don't have any authority by virtue of that kind of insight into these bodies because we don't have that kind of insight into these bodies. So we're now through uh, um, the first four stages, and uh, we, we've come now to stage five, um, at which point we create something that Locke calls nominal essences. 
Um, we create these under the pressure of our common life. As Locke says under five, words are no man's private possession, but in the common measure of commerce and communication. So our, our, our need to communicate with others uh, um, forces us to kind of discipline the linguistic diversity that I've been emphasizing up to now. We need something, at least within a particular linguistic community or a particular, well, a particular linguistic community, I'll say. Um, we need something that we could call the abstract idea of gold or the nominal essence of gold. And I just want you to imagine that at this stage, such an idea is arrived at. You could think of it perhaps as a, a, a greatest common denominator among the many ideas of gold that I was talking about earlier. It's the lar perhaps the largest collection of qualities represented in all or virtually all of the various abstract ideas that we, and by we I mean everybody, prospectors, jewelers, bankers, people of fashion, that we uh, attribute to gold. That will be the nominal essence of, uh, of gold. And this nominal essence is uh, uh, um, described in the next couple of passages on the handout. It being evident that things are ranked under names into sorts or species only as they agree to certain abstract ideas to which we've annexed those names, the essence of each genus or sort comes to be nothing but that abstract idea which the general or sortal this is actually a Lockean coinage. I don't think this word is at all common among ordinary people, but philosophers use it a lot. A sortal is a kind. It's just a word formed by Locke from the word sort, and here he is apologizing for his linguistic innovation, but it's a linguistic innovation that has endeared him to subsequent philosophers. If I may have leave to call it from sort, as I do general from genus, so as general stands to genus, sortal stands to sort, name stands for. And this we shall find to be that which the word essence imports in its most familiar use. The essence being talked about here is very clearly not the real essence that I said so much about earlier. This is a different kind of essence, as he indicates when he says that this is the uh, sense of the word in its most familiar use. The other sense was an ancient and venerable use of the word. We're now being given a more familiar uh, use of the word. And the contrast is drawn even more clearly and decisively in the next passage. The measure or boundary of each sort or species whereby it's constituted that particular sort and distinguished from all others is that we call its essence, which is nothing but the abstract idea to which the name is annexed. I'm going to read this again, or part of it again, because I'm going to make a lot of this passage and a lot about the way in which it remind, or uh, way in which I hope it reminds you of the definition of real essence that I laid so much emphasis on earlier. The measure or boundary of each sort of species whereby it is constituted that particular sort. Whereby the sort is the sort it is. This essence being talked about here, though it's a nominal essence and therefore different from the real essences that we've uh, talked about so far, is in my opinion strongly analogous to the real essences that we've talked about so far. This thing he calls a nominal essence stands to the sort as what he earlier called the real essence stands to the substance of which it's the real essence, or so I'll be suggesting. Let me continue with the passage. This, though it be all the essence of natural substances that we know, or by which we distinguish them into sorts, yet I call it by a peculiar name the nominal essence to distinguish it from the real constitution of substances, that's the real essence, upon which depends this nominal essence and all the properties of the sort, which therefore, as has been said, may be called the real essence. For example, the nominal essence of gold is that complex idea the world, word gold stands for. Let it be, for instance, a body yellow of a certain weight, malleable, fusible, and fixed. But the real essence is the constitution of the insensible parts of that body on which those qualities and all other properties of gold depend. How far these two are different, they are, uh, uh, though they're both called essence, is obvious at first sight to discover. I hope it's obvious to you. It may be uh, useful to have uh, it called to your attention that there are two dis different kinds of dependence at work here in the story Locke is telling or the story I'm telling on Locke's behalf. There's a brutally causal dependence between the real essence and the manifest qualities of the thing. The real essence of the thing is 
the cause or part of the cause of the manifest qualities of the thing. But there's also, but, but, the, but the nominal essence also enters in to a dependence relation, but it's a not, not a brutally causal uh, dependence relation, but a normative dependence relation. The nominal essence of a thing determines what may, or, or, or nominal essence determines what may appropriately be counted as an instance of a kind. So you can imagine a substance making an implicit case for membership in a kind. So I, I, I should have brought a natural substance with me that's smaller than a whale and I could hold within my hands, but imagine that I had a nugget of gold. The nugget of gold would be saying to us, in effect, I am yellow, I am hard, I am fusible, fixed, and malleable. Call me gold. That's what it would be saying. And it's saying those things by virtue of its possession of the real essence, because the real essence, in collaboration with these distant bodies that we can't even specify, the real essence is causing it to display those qualities. So it's making a case for being called gold. But then we, by appealing to the nominal essence of gold, determine whether it's fit to be called gold. That is, whether it has a right to be called gold. So it's being gold depends on two things. It depends on the real essence, which is causally responsible for its manifest qualities, and it depends also for uh, on the nominal essence, which is normatively responsible for its being gold, which is what endows it with the right to be called gold. Um, um, you see this kind of normative talk in the last passage that appears under five on the handout. Um, I begin with a circle, which is not an example of a substance for Locke, but the language Locke uses here is instructive. The idea next to the word circle, for example, Locke says is a pattern. This is, this is me expounding Locke using quotations from the essay. Is a pattern used by us, uh, quote, to determine which of the particular figures we meet with have or have not a right, and it's the word right I want to emphasize, to the name circle. And by and, and to show which of them, by having that essence, that is by conforming to that idea, was of that species. That's not, a, that's not an example of a substance, but the next example is. Similarly, it's the color, weight, fusibility, and fixedness of a sample of metal, and it's the real essence of the sample of metal that's responsible for its exhibiting these qualities. Um, that, in view of the nominal essence, makes it to be gold or gives it a right to be called gold, a right to that name. So, we're actually now almost at the end of this long process. Um, stage six is actually not a step, separate stage, but just an observation about the consequences of what took place at stage five. Uh, at stage six, I observe that by creating nominal essences, we give rise to sorts or species. Our creative work is now done. All it took to create these um, species was uh, uh, for us to create the nominal essences were, which were created by stage five. There are two lines of argument that uh, make Locke confident of this conclusion. These arguments aren't explicitly presented, but I'll show you the arguments and then read to you some passages in which I think they're implicit. The first, which you'll find under Roman numeral six on the handout, is what I call the essence argument. Um, premise one, the essence of a kind or species is its very being or that by which it is what it is. And here you see me once again emphasizing the uh, um, analogy between a remark Locke had made about um, um, what it is that constitutes a species as a species and, and the account he gives of the very being of a natural substance. Premise two, I regret the way premise two is put here and I'm gonna read you a different premise two which will save me some trouble later. Here's how I'd like premise two to read. The essence of a kind or species is the nominal essence of the things that belong to the species. Right, so I want to revise that to say the essence of a kind or species is the nominal essence of the things that belong to the species. Hence, a kind or species emerges when and only when our linguistic or conceptual activity brings its nominal essence into being. Why are we the creators of species? Why are they our workmanship, as Locke says they are? They are our workmanship because their very being depends on the uh, existence of what Locke calls nominal essences. Since we create nominal essences, these species, which depend for their existence on these nominal essences, can't exist until we create 
the nominal essences. And so they come into being only when we've created these nominal essences, and further, they, they come into being when we create these nominal essences. Um, the second argument is the boundary argument. The existence of a kind or species consists in the existence of boundaries that divide its members from whatever falls outside it. These boundaries exist if and only if a corresponding nominal essence exists. That's the second premise. And the conclusion of this argument, which is the same as the conclusion of the essence argument, hence, a kind or species, species emerges when and only when our linguistic or conceptual activity brings its nominal essence into being. Um, and uh, I think you can see both of these lines of reasoning at work in um, Locke. I'll remind you, first of all, but won't reread the passage in which he talks about the nominal essence as that which constitutes the sort. Uh, and, and then I'll, I, but I will read uh, the two passages that appear under Roman numeral six on the handout. From what's been said, it is evident that men make sorts of things. For it being different essence, essences alone that make different species, tis plain that they who make those abstract ideas which are the nominal essences do thereby make the species or sort. Uh, um, the next passage is very similar. This then in short is the case. Nature makes many particular things which do agree one with another, a point we've already acknowledged, in many sensible qualities and probably too in their internal frame and constitution. But tis not the real essence that distinguishes them into species, tis men who taking occasion from the qualities they find united in them and wherein they observe often several individuals to agree, range them into sorts in order to their naming for the convenience of, comprehending, of, of comprehensive signs. And at the very end of that passage, he says, in, a, in another passage that's important to me, uh, in this, I think, consists the whole business of genus and species. So you now have the whole business of genus and species before you. Uh, well, actually, a bit more remains to be said, but that's said in stage seven. Um, in stage seven, we account for our ideas of higher taxa or higher categories of things. I've only explained so far how you come up with an idea of gold. I haven't explained how you come up, come up with an idea of metal or an idea of body. And Locke's answer that, to that question is that you do it by editing out of the more specific ideas certain features present in it, which once edited or out or removed, give you a more general or abstract idea. So the whole hierarchy of taxa that uh, uh, we find uh, things falling beneath. There's a nugget of gold, there's the category gold or the species gold, there's the genus metal, the higher genus, rather very high genus body. Um, all of those are nothing, that whole business has now been described. All of that is just a matter of our forming nominal essences, nominal essences being what constitutes the species to which I've just called your attention. Um, uh, that concludes the story that I wanted to tell on Locke's behalf. So I want to make one concluding uh, observation about it. I, I want to uh, call your attention to the way in which the story radically redirects or, or disrupts an ancient tradition of thinking. This is a tradition of thinking known as Neoplatonism, and it's represented by a man named Ralph Cudworth who uh, some of you may have heard. Certainly if you were in our workshop for the past two days, you, you heard that name mentioned several times. L Cudworth says things about the essences of, uh, of things that sound very much like Locke. Cudworth says things like this. The essences of things are, quote, nothing but objective entities in the mind or no amata or ideas. So he describes essences as ideas, just as Locke describes nominal essences as ideas. But Cudworth's essences are in the mind of God. And uh, Cudworth actually makes an argument for the existence of God uh, on the basis of the existence of, 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 of essences conceived as he conceives them. It is, he says, an acknowledged truth that the essences of things are eternal and such as were never made. Now, Locke doesn't agree with that, by the way, but you'll see that he's able to agree with something in Cudworth in just a moment. It's an acknowledged truth that the essences were never made. They must therefore exist, since they never came into a, to being, in an eternal mind, and there must therefore be an eternal mind that can serve as their host. There must be, as Cudworth says, one eternal unmade mind 
uh, uh, and perfect incorporeal deity, which comprehends all of these essences. This is an argument for God's existence that was first made perhaps by St. Augustine and is made by Leibniz in the monadology, uh, if you happen to read that or if you will read that in your modern philosophy uh, survey, you'll, 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 you'll find it. Locke wants to be responsive to what animates this argument. Locke says in the essay, we're told concerning essences that they're all ingenerable and incorruptible. But it isn't, he says, the real essences of things that are ingenerable and uncorruptible. As we saw earlier, they begin and perish with things themselves. The real essence of Moby Dick isn't something ingenerable and incorruptible. It is, in fact, in constant flux in Locke's opinion, because in his view, everything in the universe is in constant flux. Uh, God accepted. What is it then that remains steadily the same, that remains safe and entire or above the fray as things mutate? It's the nominal essences. They are ingenerable and incorruptible, even though they're created by us, and they're ingenerable or incorruptible in the following very modest or diminished sense. They suffer no change when things change. And this is Locke's way of, of, of capturing uh, a, a kind of piety that the Neoplatonic tradition insisted on. He purchases, purchases though, very cheaply. He doesn't need to lodge these nominal essences in the mind of God. Uh, they are our creations, but they are ingenerable and incorruptible because once they're created, and so long as re they remain as they are, their fate is indifferent to the fortunes of the things falling under them. All right, so we now have the story before us, and, I, and, and, and my intention now in the second part of the paper, I'm going to keep talking for a while. I think I started late, so I hope it's all right if I continue to talk. I think there should be time for questions, at least I hope there is. Sorry, so we have about, okay, so I will go really rapidly through, through the rest of this. Um, um, I, I now want to call your attention to the um, um, simplicity and strength of this, uh, of this story. And um, I, I'll, I'll have to do this very uh, crudely. In, in doing this, I'm going to be evaluating Locke's views as I presented them to you using a standard that's suggested by the 20th century philosopher Iris Murdoch. She suggests that views should be tested by uh, what she speaks of under, under four on the handout uh, as their power to connect, to illuminate, to explain, and to make new and fruitful places for reflection. And I think making new and fruitful places for reflection is in part a matter of closing off old and tired uh, uh, um, uh, uh, occasions for reflection. So I'm going to uh, 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 give a, a defense of Locke's way of thinking uh, uh, along the lines uh, suggested here by Murdoch. I'll begin with a, a personal experience about an essay I once read by a man named Baird Callicott. I read this essay in the early 1980s, and it made a kind of impression on me that it probably would not make on most of you now because you're, especially the young people here, are growing up in the age of bioengineering, and you're very used to the suggestion that a, that a biological creature is something that might, for example, be patented. But that was an idea quite foreign to me and to people generally, I think, in, in the 1980s. Baird Callicott wrote an essay in which he described farm animals or domestic animals as artifacts. And I was really struck by that, and especially by his way of, uh, of putting it. He, he talked about driving through the countryside and seeing a, 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 a beautiful hillside dotted with cows, which most of us would appreciate as a lovely, maybe even natural scene. It, for him, it was like looking at a, at a hillside uh, uh, with so many billboards scattered around. That's the way it seemed to him. And this essay made a big impression on me. And I spent quite a few days, maybe even longer than days, wondering whether cows, for example, were really artifacts. Are they really artifacts? It troubled me. It seemed to me that, that I ought to be able to determine whether or not they, they, are, they are artifacts. The, the suggestion had been made, and it was up to me to determine whether it was true that they were artifacts or, or, or false. But then I, 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 I came, my intellectual turmoil uh, ended. I, I, I achieved a kind of calm when I reminded myself of some Lockean lessons. Artifact is just a nominal essence that we create. There's nothing in it beyond what our past deeds or past needs have invested it with. And I was under the illusion of thinking that by, by pondering the question further, I could discover the natural difference between artifacts and non-artifacts, or some God-given difference between artifacts and non-artifacts that would answer my question. And when I persuaded myself, in the spirit of Locke's account of nominal essences, that, was, there, that there was no hope for resolving my difficulty by that means, I found myself able to leave the question and go on. 
Second, and I'll be very brief uh, in, in each of these next two points, um, the distinction between sex and gender is a very commonplace one in the academy. Uh, uh, sex is being things that are identified by physical characteristics. I'll say substances that are identified by physical characteristics. I'm thinking of here of, of sexes like human female and uh, human male. Uh, genders being things identified by social roles. And here I'm thinking of man and woman. This is a very elementary distinction for people in the academy. I don't know how many of you have tried to introduce it into polite conversation. It's not very easy to do. I find by experience that a brief course in the Lockean account of kind formation makes it much likelier that people will be able to accept this distinction and makes it much likelier that people, once they've accepted it, will be able to take seriously the suggestion that the genders woman and the gender gender man and the gender woman should perhaps be changed. They take much more seriously the suggestion that it, that it, that it, that it should perhaps be changed because they find it easier to separate the genders uh, from the sexes which seem to them to be not so easily changeable or not so easily changeable by the means that the person they're talking to has in view. So I think uh, uh, when it comes to that the, 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 the Lockean understanding of kinds creates uh, an environment very receptive for, uh, very receptive to the distinction between sex and gender, and very receptive to efforts to liberate ourselves from destructive uh, social constructions. Um, third, uh, I think that the view also presents a very useful environment for thinking about race. A race could be um, um, defined by means of a list of observable characteristics, and perhaps some people, many people, I imagine, do think of race in that way. Uh, but I think it's also possible, and within the spirit of Locke's account of nominal essences, to add a certain element to the nominal essences of races, for example, that I'll call stipulations. A stipulation is a requirement we lay down that things have to meet in order to qualify as members of the kind. And I think of this as in the spirit of Locke's account because um, um, we can lay down the requirement without claiming any insight into the real essences of the things that we're uh, uh, concerned with. Um, when we lay down a stipulation, though, we do um, expose the kind that we're characterizing to a certain kind of challenge. Let me make this more more, uh, um, 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 more concrete. Suppose we build in the thought that in races the common observable characteristics have a biological basis. And suppose we understand the way that biological basis functions as follows. We suppose that if you take any two individuals from within the race, the distance between them with respect to that biological basis is always smaller than the distance between one of those individuals and any individual selected from outside the race. Are you with me? So the distance between those within the race with respect to the biological basis must always be smaller than the distance between an individual within the race and an individual outside the race with respect to that same uh, biological basis. And it turns out that on the most plausible understanding of biological basis, this is false. And this is the source of many people's conclusion that races don't exist. And it seems to me that Locke's account of nominal essences gives you a ready way of understanding why people make that argument. But it also gives you a ready way of understanding a reply made to that kind of argument by defenders of what they call the ordinary concept of race. Uh, um, why not? Uh, if races have just been proven not to exist, why not revise our concept of race? Why not remove the troublesome stipulation and stick with observable qualities? And Leibniz, by the way, who was a perceptive critic of Locke, actually imagined a conception of race of this sort, a conception that would lay stress on externals, as he puts it. Um, why not um, just re re um, resort or return to a list of purely observable characteristics, or why not come up with some more plausible stipulation that isn't so easily defeated by scientific discovery? Locke, it seems to me, makes uh, it possible to appreciate both of these positions, and it might also make it possible to rest easy if you find yourself at the end of the argument with more than one concept of race. You needn't choose between them, perhaps, because you might find one concept useful in one setting and another concept useful in another setting. It seems to me that Locke uh, is, uh, uh, will, will, will leave you very receptive to that possibility. I want to conclude now with three complications um, um, for Locke. The, 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 um, and I'll, I will discuss these very briefly so there's at least a moment for questions. Um, the first is what is a sort? Um, you might be puzzled as to what a sort is in the end. 
after all. And I wish I could say more about this because this is the part that might be of particular interest uh, to my colleagues. Philosophers nowadays entertain all sorts of things that might be identified with sorts that are not going to be uh, eligible candidates for sorthood according to Locke because they are not our workmanship. So sets, and here I'm just addressing myself to the philosophers here, sets cannot be sorts as Locke understands them because sets are not our workmanship as classically understood. Muriological sums cannot be sorts because muriological sums as standardly understood are not our workmanship. Um, yeah. Oh, you are? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, um, but another possible candidate is pluralities. Perhaps pluralities could be sorts. Locke has the concept of a plural plurality, but in the passages I quote under one uh, uh, on the handout, he uh, seems to suggest that sorts cannot be pluralities, that plur pluralities, which are just the things, are not the same as the sort. I'll be happy to say more about that to my colleagues later. What then is a sort? Locke actually gives an interesting answer to what a sort is. A sort is nothing but an idea, in his view. And he says this in the passages listed under sortal idealism. We can't be too cautious that words and species in the ordinary notions which we have been used to of them impose not on us, for I'm apt to think therein lies one great obstacle to our clear and distinct knowledge, especially in reference to substances. Would we accustom ourselves to separate our contemplations and reasonings from words, we might in a great measure remedy this inconvenience within our own thoughts, but yet it would still disturb us in our discourse with others, so long as we retained the opinion that species and their essences were anything else but our abstract ideas, such as they are, with names annexed to them to be the signs of them. And here I want to recall my claim that the essence of a sort is the nominal essence. The sort is an idea. That's, there's nothing to it but the idea. And uh, that's a very comforting view, and unmysterious view of what a sort is, and it fits in with the many themes that I'm not going to enumerate now that, um, um, uh, that, that I've been uh, emphasizing. Uh, in the end, I'm not sure I want to say that Locke embraces the claim that sorts are ideas, even though in the passage I've just read and in another one he seems to say so, because in the end I don't think he's all that interested in telling you metaphysically speaking what sorts are. The unit of analysis for him is the whole business of genus and species. And once the whole business of genus and species is laid out, you understand all you need to know about what sorts are, and it isn't fruitful perhaps to ask the question, what is a sort? be like asking after years in the shoe business, what's an inventory? Is it the set of all the shoes I have in stock or the myriological sum of all the shoes I have in stock? Or is it uh, the plurality of the shoes I have in stock? Once you have been in the shoe business and know how it works, you don't need to ask the question. Um, are there shared real essences? Under two on the handout, I give you an argument, I sketch an argument uh, that allows Locke cautiously to affirm their existence. I won't review it because I need to end. I'll just mention one final problem in closing. It seems hard to believe that species could be our workmanship because it seems there are, or at least that there could be, species unmade by us. And Locke recognizes, or at least entertains, the possibility of many such things, various ranks of angels, for example. He thinks there are many, many of these things, and they probably do exist. Extraterrestrials, which he doesn't affirm, extraterrestrial species, I mean, he doesn't affirm their existence, but he seems to think they're possible, as yet undiscovered minerals. He points out that the Native Americans never discovered iron. No doubt there's metals beneath the earth that's undiscovered by any of us. That is, it's, there seem to be species of natural substances beneath the earth unknown to us. How could they be if substances are our workmanship? And finally, you may be wondering about divine authority. What about God's own species? Um, can't God create species? Well, Locke's answer to that last question is yes, God can create species, but his species have no claim on us, at least so long as God doesn't punish us for failing to respect the species boundaries that God draws. I think Locke can make sense of all these possibilities simply by saying 
that there are individuals that don't fall into a species of the requisite specificity that we now um, uh, recognize and that we might recognize to be, oh, that we would recognize to be other species were we to encounter them. So we can preserve the workmanship thesis in the face of the claim that there are undiscovered or unnamed species simply by understanding them to be species that exist just by virtue of the fact that the individuals that, con that enter into them would be classified as by us as belonging to other species were we to encounter them. And when we did encounter them, we'd be responsive to their observable characteristics and we'd construct kinds on uh, uh, their basis. By means of this account, Locke gives both nature and our own selves uh, their due. Nature is responsible for the similarities, but we are responsible for the sortal boundaries and therefore for the existence of the sorts. Thank you. Right. 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 Yeah, I, th I, th I think I skirted over that too quickly, but I meant to be bringing it in when I talked about the kind of pressure toward common understanding that's exerted by the fact that we need to communicate and cooperate with others. Right, so right. Have, why that uh, it, it would be. So kinds don't have to be socially constructed, but in, in so the, in, 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 but, but the kinds of greatest importance to us are socially constructed because they arise out of this kind of uh, collaboration uh, um, that's forced on us by our need to communicate and join with others in common projects. Okay. Right, is that? Could it, yeah, oh yeah, there's no, there, there, there's no reason. Right, and, and, and Locke, Locke recognizes at least two goals of language, as, as, as you know. One is to communicate with others, and one is to record your own thoughts. You could develop your, your own private system of kinds and record your thoughts uh, about nature, say, in a journal, but you couldn't yet use it to communicate with anyone. And when you tried communicate, communicate, communicating with others, you'd find yourself at the beginning of a process of negotiation that would entitle me to say, I mean, maybe I'm being overdramatic here, that, that the product is a social construction because it arises out of uh, a, 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 a negotiation between you and others. Yeah. Nelson? The, the, the question was uh, whether the Latin wor uh, um, um, proclamations that I gave you suffer from the same ambiguity as the English. I think it does suffer from the same ambiguity, generally. The, the Burgers like one may not, because the, the, there's an extra element in that, whereby a thing both is. That's interesting. And, uh, um, um, it's an interesting question what the relationship between essence, however understood, and existence is. And I have, am, have not said anything about this this afternoon. But I think it's an, it's an interesting uh, 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 um, question. It's obvious that when God creates something, he gives it both an essence and an existence, right? And I think it's an interesting question whether the existence is contained in the real essence. And if that's not an interesting question, the, the relationship between the real essence and the existence is, 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 is a more general interesting question. And I haven't, I haven't taken a stand on that here, uh, although I'm inclined, yeah, I, I haven't taken a stand on it here. Um, 
Yes. Hmm. how puns are created. But Hegel recognizes actually a two-way process that I'm wondering if Locke does as well. So for, so the story you told about Locke's way of creating kinds and species is largely a bottom-up process uh, from the natural, the real essences through the nominal essences to this, the individual construction and the social construction. Um, Hegel also recognizes a top-down process, which I thought kind of got snuck in by Locke. So for example, Hegel points out that, uh, that once you have, say, a concept of metal, then that also helps to determine what counts as different sorts of metals. And in one of the quotations you have here, Locke says that gold is a sample of metal that has blah, blah, blah characteristics. But that means that gold already has to be determined as a metal with blah, blah, blah characteristics before it gets to count as gold. So there's this top-down process for Hegel, according to which the abstract, the, the higher taxa, to use Locke's terminology, also help to determine what counts as samples or examples of lower taxa. Right. And I wondered if, 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 if that was, if, if you see any, any version of that kind of story in Locke. I, I, I don't remember any texts in which th that kind of top-down process is described, but it seems to me compatible with Locke's basic outlook. Once you're in possession of the concept metal, you might find yourself identifying something as a metal before any more specific information about it has revealed itself, right? Uh, you might notice that it resembles other metals in being a metal, and uh, y you might know very little about it beyond that, and you might, on the basis of further investigation, discover those further qualities and come up with the nominal essence of that thing, which would have incorporated from the beginning the higher, um, um, the, the higher genus that I'm imagining uh, 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 entered the story in the case of gold only later but that was just the way uh, I told it. Oh, I, I see a difference. I, you know, modes was something I was hoping not to have to discuss, but 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 I I, I don't have anything new to say about it in, in the short time available to me. But uh, in the case of all the natural substances that I've been talking about, we're aiming to capture combinations of qualities that exist in the things themselves. In the case of ideas of modes, there's. Uh, not at least necessarily any such intention. So uh, they're uh, um, um, uh, uh, more arbitrarily or more voluntarily put together than ideas of substances are. Uh, modes, as Locke understands them, are more obviously social constructions than substances are, but, so, but, but substances are social constructions as well for the reasons that I've been, uh, that I've been emphasizing. Did you have a more specific question that you wanted to ask no. after hearing that? Yeah. I, 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 mean, I, I can say a little bit more. In, in the case of sex and gender, uh, there may be something more to, s to be said. Um, because Locke is not as much of a social constructionist as present day social constructionists are when it comes to gender, for example. Because while Locke thinks that both sex and gender, or both sexes and genders are socially constructed because all kinds are, and sexes and, sexes and genders are kinds, he doesn't uh, have to think, or he doesn't thereby think, that the characteristics definitive of a gender, for example, are socially constructed. Now, many of them will turn out to be modes, it seems to me. And, many, and, and, and those modes are themselves products of social construction. So a full account of the way in which genders are social constructions would probably have to say more about modes than I've said. And would also probably have to um, 
uh, um, um, take a point of view on kinds that Locke generally doesn't take, but Hegel does. Uh, Locke has a very spectatorial view of the kinds that he's talking about. He's thinking of us as people who classify things into kinds and then investigate them. So he, he, he suggests that we have a very theoretical um, 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 relationship to the, to the kinds of which he speaks. Hegel doesn't see things, and modern day social constructionists don't see things that way. They're interested in the way in which these social constructions um, um, influence our very ways of being. And Locke, it seems to me, has perhaps no sense, but certainly no lively sense of the way in which a social construction can influence your very way of structuring your life. There, is, uh, there are some potential counterexamples to that, but in general, I don't think he's very, al very much alive to that, to that possibility. Yes, I, right. They, 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 they sort themselves, yeah. Because of they, them desiring each other for mating purposes and so on and so forth. Right. So, so there is, even for Hegel, a materiality underneath the, some kind of something underneath the way in which we organize our kinds. And, and Locke does not ignore questions of propagation and, and lineage, uh, but, but it's, not, it's not generally applicable because it applies only to living things. Yeah. Well, great, so we can thank our speaker one more time. I just think it's a wonderful opportunity um, for our students here at Lehman to see professional philosophers at work. And um, so I'm really pleased uh, that Professor Gordon Roth is here at Lehman. She's a fairly new faculty member, and I'm very pleased um, that uh, we have this event and these kinds of events at Lehman because I think it's, it's important and wonderful for our students to see what professional philosophers and academics do. So I, I think it's a wonderful event.